This is Janice Unwin on behalf of Kutmaiden Information Centre Oral History Project. On the 26th of November 1993, Potlogan Women's Rural Institute celebrated their 70th birthday. To mark this occasion, a clock has been purchased and presented to James Stewart, Chairman of Potlogan Hall Committee. Tonight, Jimmy Stewart is here in Potlogan Hall to talk to Potlogan Women's Institute about the history of Potlogan Hall. Well, ladies and one gentleman, it's not very often I address various meetings in my life, but not very often a whole female group. Thank you for coming, Mike. Uh, but I'd like to start, before I start, I'd like to say to all the ladies of the rural and your president, thank you very much for this presentation of a clock. As I said, usually you get presents on your birthday, but you don't give them away. However, it will be here, I suppose, when some of you are here at the 100th anniversary of Port Logan Rural, that clock will still be there recording the time. So, I like your president's approach when she says, will you come to the hall and, ex and accept a clock on behalf of the rural to the hall? Which is a nice wee way of getting round the rest of it. And she says, maybe you'd give us a wee talk about the lifeboats and the origin of the hall. So, I'll do my best. I don't know whether I'll manage it all or not, but I'll do my best. The first life-saving apparatus that was in here was the Life LSA, the local volunteer service, which is now the Rocket Brigade. And it was here from 81, 1881 and was shifted to Drumore in 1904. At that particular time, there was also word that the the lifeboat put on this station. So they had to think about getting a hall. And if you want to know the origin of the hall, the, ori the origin of the hall is, as you, most of you know, it was built as a lifeboat house. But in 1866, the, the contract for building this hall was let to a man, McGough, who lived at Clanyard Mill. And he started to build this hall sometime in early March, I think, and he finished it in the end of October. And if you look at this building, there's no shoddy workmanship in this at all. So in these days, they could really build buildings. However, at this particular time, it was decided to set up a branch of the RNLI in Port Logan and Loose Bay. So it was called the Port Logan and Loose Bay Rescue Service, affiliated to the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. The patrons for the, the body that was set up, or the patron was the Earl of Stair, the president was the Laird of Logan, Colonel McDowell, one son, James McDowell, the local secretary of the Rocket Brigade, Mr. McCurley, Mr. Maitland of Fruch, a Dr. Ross from St. Head, and the local parish minister who at that particular time was the Reverend James Caven. So the the boat was being built and subscribed for by the working men of Edinburgh under the direction of Mr. Ballantyne. She was built, I don't know whether in Edinburgh or, or in Glasgow, but she was fitted out in Glasgow by public subscription and she was named the Edinburgh and R.M. Ballantyne and that was the first boat that came here. She arrived in Stranraer about the 1st of December 1866 by rail, transported free by the LMNS. The crew from Port Logan went in under the coxswain of John Brown was the coxswain's name who went to Sonar to pick up the boat, also the four horses went. They paraded the boat right through the Stonar and stopped at the cross for fifteen minutes and were addressed by a commander of the Royal Navy, who in his address said something about men who go down to the sea in ships, but men who save, go out in the elements that a lifeboat goes out in to save them are brave men also, the men of a lifeboat crew. She was brought home, after she was paraded through St. she was brought home and put in here, and that was her. She was officially launched on the 28th of December, and the launching ceremony was conducted by the Laird's son, 
I don't know why, because there doesn't seem to be much difference between him being formed and that committee and the, the launch and salad. But it's the 28th of December when she was officially launched. She was taken out on, into the bay there on a very beautiful day, rode about for a while, brought back into the centre of the bay and capsized, Tilo, and she righted herself in eight seconds. They were all, I suppose, self writing types. I know the last one was. But anyway, the, she was, it was quite successful. They brought her in near the shore, there was a schooner lying in at the harbour, and they put the rocket line across the schooner and took two men off the schooner very successfully. Her next, uh, her first service launch was in almost a year after, when the barks, the caravan, ran ashore in the float bay. Uh, Two of the crew of that boat got ashore in the small boat, but none of the rest of them got off. And they went to a Mr. McCulloch at the low float, who sent a man on horseback to call out the lifeboat. There's a wee bit of a mystery there, that if you think on four horses taking a boat from here to Float Bay, I thought they'd be much quicker and launched her there than taking her, uh, well, unless it was a northwesterly or northerly gale, it may have been difficult to get out of the bay with her. But anyway... They took, 20, they took 15 of a crew off that when the uh, skipper and Mr. Captain Gilmer had given up hope and had uh, decided that they would jump in the sea and risk their lives and try and get ashore of their own accord. When they noticed this light in the dark, and it was the light. So they took 15 of the crew off, the other two were already off, so there were 17 of a crew. They brought them into Port Logan at 4 o'clock in the morning and they were received by the runner. James Cochran of Dane. Port Logan took them in and he gave them hot clothing and dry, uh, fed them. Gave them dry clothing and fed them, sorry. Uh, anyway, when Captain Gilmer saw the name of the boat, he discovered that he had been the first man who had been rescued by the, that boat and his wife had been a subscriber to a fitting out. So she was here, but there's another wee bit of a mystery there, that she was replaced by another Edinburgh and all in Bantine, with a different set of self-writing tanks. These were air tanks that the first one had, but the second one seemed to have water ballast tanks. And she was replaced by that, which is, there's no record of that there. She stayed here at about 91, and she was replaced by the Frederick Allen. The Frederick Allen was here for quite a, and these boats did sterling service when they were here and saved quite a lot of lives. She was replaced, she was here to about 19... Five, I think, the Frederick Allen, but she was replaced by another boat that I never heard of. Her. And it must have been something that happened to the Frederick Allen because she was replaced by an auxiliary ship which was much weird called the Lilibut. And she was here until the Thomas McCunn, the last boat, came. She arrived at Stonar Harbour, but instead of being brought by a road, she was launched at Stonar under the new coxswain of James Galloway, who was in Logan Fishbone and the crew brought her to Port Logan by, by sea. She would do two or three very good uh, rescues herself, but I think four, I think she is four to her credit. Anyway, uh, there was some, as you realised, that the horses were there, to, that she could be transported over land, and it was a slow business of calling out the lifeboat in these days, because by the time he called out the lifeboat, and called out the horses. It was quite a long time before the boat could get underway. And one episode I do remember very clearly was she was called out to the Hamilton, which was a boat, a puffer belonging to Marshall and Moore. I don't know how many folk here belong, remember Marshall and Moore, but it was Gene McComb's grandfather at Seabank, and he was the grain merchant in the Moor. I think Mrs. Buchanan knows who I'm talking about. Mr. Martin Tyre's grandfather, too. Uh, anyway, they decided that the Thomas McCunn was a heavier boat and they worked with six horses. And the four horses had a little, well, practically a bridge house there when they brought two. The four were from Columpha. The four horses were from Columpha. And if you look at some of these photos, you'll notice that the horses were attached to the back of the stern of the boat as much the same way as they were to a farm cart. The two in the shafts were attached, the same as if they had been in a farm cart with the crew, say. The other two were ridden, postillion as they call, the tracers were ridden by the men that belonged to them. But this day they decided to put six in, because they were going to launch it at Torrey. And uh, they, got, they put the four 
along the four took the well, horses took her along to Bridge House there and at Bridge House they yoked to the two in front. And they were still at Bridge House an hour and a half after that. They never moved. The ones in the middle would not go forward because the two in the front they didn't know. They decided to change it round and put the two that were in the front in the middle. And it was far worse then because the two in the shaft wouldn't even move because there were two strange horses in front of them. However, that boat only went, that boat was, was turned at any corner because she was just brought back because the Hamilton had got into difficulties. She was supposedly to get in difficulties every time she went over the model. She was in difficulties that day. However, that was about 1923 and that was about the last episode of the horses. The tractor came, the caterpillar tractor came to, to move her about. Now the caterpillar was not any faster on the road, but the boat was either in the, on the road or in the sea when the crew arrived. She was much quicker moved about, although on, on transport she didn't move any faster than the horses. But that was in 25. But the real episode that I do remember of the Thomas McCunn was going to the homewood on the 13th of November. No, it wasn't a Friday, don't say anything. It was a Saturday. And she was called out. And two of the crew, it was blowing a 468 west northwest gale. And two of the crew refused to go. And two volunteers stepped in who the only time they'd ever had any contact with seawater would be washing their feet in the summertime. And these two men were the dairyman from Columbia, John Morland who would be somewhere about 65, and Larry McPhail, who looked after the Highland cattle at Ochabrick. And they went to the homewood. Now, Doc Scott and I went up to the top of my daddy moor there and lay behind a tough dike and watched her through the Clanyard Bay, and I never saw a boat taking a butter on the lake. But we realised there was another boat outside her. There was another something outside her. But however, they had made fairly good contact. And we decided this was for Patrick Boat, and for Logan Boat hadn't hoped because this boat was a motorboat coming from a part. So we didn't know anything more about it until the boat arrived at the, at the wreck, and it was the homewood, who was under tow by a tug the Thunderer, and had drifted from the Mull of Galloway, had dropped sea anchors, the tug had lost her, and the tug had turned and gone down the other side of Lush Bay into East Darwin for shelter. And the, the homewood, who hadn't even engine in her, was left at the mercy of the Irish Channel. But she dropped sea anchor somewhere about the west of it and they held and the, light, the Logan lifeboat got to her and turned her head seaward into the wind and the Portpatrick boat came in between them in between the homewood and the Portpatrick boat after the Portpatrick boat had a line of, aboard the homewood and she sprang the boat, the boat plant where the Thomas McCunn was sprung by the by the note However, the captain of the homewood or the skipper of the homewood said that he would rather drown in the boat he was in than drown in the boat that they'd come in to try and get it. So the Port Logan boat took five men off that, and as the tide and wind were more favourable to go round the mull, they went round the mull and took them into the moor. Uh, for there were five of a crew, and they took them into the moor. And I heard that the Port Patrick boat also got in difficulties at Cairnless Point out there, and the Port Logan boat went back again and brought her into the moor, escorted her into the moor. Now the strangest irony about the whole of that was that the lady who was in the ship hotel at that particular time had been in school with the whole, nearly the whole crew of Logan boat. She allowed them to get past her door. She stopped at a party boat and fed them all. The Logan by boat crew had, had two torches for them and two glasses of chocolate from the left here at nine o'clock in the morning to come back here at seven o'clock at night. However, it was quicker coming back because the, the, the tractor took the carriage to the moor and picked her up and brought her home. But 1930, the end of 1930, Billy Hutton, who was a great friend of mine, said to me one night, we're to go and meet the Admiral. Now, the Admiral was the crew's name for the corpse, and I'm sorry, I missed a bit there, but I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Uh, and we went to see the Admiral, who lives in the house I live in now, and I joined the lifeboat crew in that house. Billy Hutton and I joined in Bayview. It wasn't baby. I don't know what baby or no. But the bit it did, it was, uh, actually you need to be looking at these photographs to see what I mean. That about 1916 or 17 there was some celebration on the boat is green there, which is a photograph with a crew that I remember all that crew. I know all that crew. And there's, it must have been 16 or, if it was 16, it was a 50th anniversary of the founding of the station. 
because there are soldiers in that photograph and I remember being brought to it on the shoulders of a sailor who was home and leave from the Royal Navy and he brought none by the hand and we came to this, whatever that was, we don't know. But what I do know is that I said before that James Garrow was the coxswain of the lifeboat. Now that photograph is maybe 16, I don't know, maybe in the 50th anniversary, I'm not, can't just be sure of that. But in 19, it's pre-1921, because these three galleries, there was James who was the coxswain, his brother Willie who was Mrs. Gulu's father, and James Gallagher, who, Adam Gallagher, who became the coxswain, were three brothers, and on the longest day in 21, they were fishing trails in Barn Court Bay when they were hit by a tidal wave, and their boat was capsized. Now the one that couldn't swim was put onto the top of the upturned boat, and the two who could swim decided to try and swim for the shore, but they were never seen again, they were never got. Well, James was got, but it was a body that was got. But they were drowned in that episode. So Adam, despite the fact that they'd come through that terrible day in Barncourt Bay, which was not a terrible day, it was a very calm day, but there just happened to be a tidal wave, he took over as coxswain. So we joined the crew with Adam Gallagher as coxswain, Billy Hutton and I. Now, there's not much more of a story to tell on that side of the boat, except that she was called out once again to Young, to young Man Bay to be launched to go to the assistance of a Dutch trawler. But she hadn't been very far, far into the bait as she was recalled because the Dutch trawler had got into the moor. There was some unrest in the crew, although I wasn't there that night because I never knew the boat was out till the next morning. But anyway, there was some unrest among the crew about that time. So uh, now I'll go back to your hall. I'll try and tell you the story of the hall. By 1920, I think 1920, there was a, a committee formed in Port Logan with a background that they would eventually build a hall in Port Logan. Now that committee was formed, that committee consisted of Miss McConnell at Maldagie, Miss Gallagher who's in the post office, Mr and Mrs Kosh, who was the blacksmith and his wife, Mrs Party who was in the library reading room where Jim Lecce now lives, uh, Mr and Mrs Hutton, amazing and his wife as they talked a bit now, and my father and mother. Now that committee were formed to try and eventually got our money, but if you reckon you had a dance and had to go to the school to have a dance and it was half a crown of admission, it took a long time to get a hundred pounds. But they had another wee thing they did in common with these, raising this money for the hall. In these particular days, there was not much for really people who were really poor. And there were three ladies who lived in Port Logan who really were living on parish relief, which I understand was about eight shillings a month to go out of the parish and that was what they got to live in. Well if you're right they got a loaf for two items, for two and shapney and a pint of milk for three items. It, there was the comparison now you don't agree at all. But anyway, it was like the, the life we're living in now, the fact to try and keep these ladies warm. This committee bought them two tons of coal each every year and the rest of the money went into this hall fund. Now, these particular ladies lived, the first one was a Jane McMaster who lived where Mrs. Berwick lives, the second one was a Mrs. Kane who lives where Elaine lives, the third one was Ellen Teer, a bit of a character, a terrible character she was, and she lived in Nana's kitchen. But anyway, she was a, a terrible character. You know, she lived in a house in, up above Jimmy Reed's garden, a wee ruin in Jimmy Reed's garden, and worked for a fellow McClumphy and a brick. But there was quite a big crowd of foresters in Logan at that particular time, and she tried to earn a living by working out in Columbia. She was in turnips one day in Mount Sally Hill up there, on the side of Mount Sally Road, and the foresters were cutting hedges, and they were making a lot of fun of her and trying to take a nap of her. And she turned round to the head forester and she says, if you take us from our level and set us on the stage, there's no more difference between a snider or a turnip and a pruner or a hedge. So that was him. She kept, instead of a cut, she kept a pet rat. That was what she kept for a pet. So the committee went on right through to about 1930, 1931. There was a meeting in the library and uh, discovered that it had gathered in this particular time £461 was the total sum of money. And 
you throw it, 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 this amount of money and a uh, grant from the Ferguson request, you could probably build a home. However, the Ferguson request turned down the request and didn't get that. And Mr. Bowie, who was the local factor at that time, or the state factor at that time, was asked to get estimates to build a hall. And he came to a meeting uh, in, in, I think, October 1931 with a, a, an estimate to build a stone and lime hall at £860. So, however, I can get back to the lifeboat now. The fact that this, there had been a slight unrest among the crew for a year or two about the handling of the boat, and we were called to a meeting in the beginning of November up that stair and this table there. And that table got some abuse that night. But this Lieutenant Upton, the Laird of Logan, the secretary, I can't, I can't understand why that was, but the, the man who came as secretary was Thomas McCracken, who was like a uh, wireless manager in Remore, and why was in Remore. And he was at that meeting. However, the crew actually, oh, they were, it, was, it was really rough that night. One costing up the other, what they would have done and what they should have done. However, we discovered then that the coxswain had decided he would retire. The stroke oar, the man in the stroke, was retiring. The bowman was retiring. Then this up and turned down and told Billy Hunt and I that we could not be ensured at Lloyd's because we were not 18. And as, just after the ride this afternoon, the whole crew were lost. Every lifeboatman had to be insured at Lloyd's, so we were out. So they were left with eight of a crew, and we suggested that, somebody suggested anyway, that Adam Gallagher from the fish pond, the son of the old coxswain who was drowned, could be quite willing to take the boat, or quite able to take the boat, and they said, up and said, right away, no, no, he's only one eye. He had lost his eye with a carbide, an explosion of carbide. So that was left with eight of a crew. But the laird had so much power over the crew that were left, because they were either forest or gardeners or in the fish pond or such, such an estate. You see, if I go through the crew that was in that boat when I was in it, the stroke was Johnny McClough and not Adam Galloway with the one eye, uh, John Galloway and Billy Hutton, Craig Hutton and myself in the middle, uh, Willie McConnell and Ian Hutton were next, Tom McConnell and Fergus Lesher were the last two with Adam Galloway's corpse and Sonny Party, a second corpse, and Archie McBride, who was the head gardener of Logan, was the bowman. Now, there's a wee bit, a, a bit of a, an ironic happening there, that when the Patrick lifeboat went to the Victoria, the corpse was not at home, and Billy McConnell, who lived in, who was in that crew, and sat in front of Fergus Lassie in that crew, was the corpse who took the Patrick lifeboat to the Victoria, and Fergus Lecky was one of the crew of the Victoria and was drowned on the Victoria. So that was a sort of ironic bit about that crew. However, we were, we were left with the crew, and as I said, the laird had so much command over the crew that he just decided. This was the solution of Port Logan Hall. We we'll closed the station, and the station was closed in January 32, and the boat sold to Peter Bigham in Port Patrick, who used her as a place of boat and brought folk to Port Logan to the fish bone in that boat. That boat is still to the fore. The Thomas McCone is still to the fore. She's sailing as the Moyach on the Thames. That's where she is. And so we go out round now to the getting up to the make the building of the hall. On the eleventh of july thirty two the contract was let to James Moffat at Glenview up at the Moore School to put this into a hall. Now can you reckon you had somewhere about Oh, would that be 19, 18 feet of door, maybe 14 feet high, on both ends. He built these annexes, the two annexes, the toilets and the ladies' float room here, the kitchen, and that. He went at the front there and built up both ends. And I think that would be the mason's work. But on the 12th of July, a crap from a brick, a crap from a slash, and a crap from a daddy, I think, crafted sand and gravel all day on the 12th of July, and we've got a lot of volunteers who filled, and we only crafted, and there was enough material put on the ground there. But when you reckon that he charged two and fourpence an hour for his journeyman, and he was paying them one and fourpence an hour, he was left with a shilling to buy all the reinforcement and all the cement that it took to put this into a hall. That was the the mason side of it, decided, making it into a hall. 
He, I noticed in the, in the minutes, which were kept very minutely by the late Mrs. Hannah, and I have them now, and I noticed that there was a, an overpayment of some kind to Mr. Moffat, and he gave them back £2.16 and thirpence as being overpaid. However, the, the joiners then came in and they had to lift the floor in this hall as there was a two feet run in this floor. And the, the, there was concave also that ran all the water from the boat into the middle of the hall. There was also uh, granite sets. The floor was all granite sets. And it was a beautifully built floor. Lot. However, that had all to be brought up to the level it is at now. Now, Mr. Moffat's bill was £166, and the joiner's bill to put on the doors, line out. Now, I understand that a lot of that lining came from the original doors, so there was 12 of them. There were three at each side that folded back, and there was 12 of them, and I understand that a lot of that lining was taken uh, out of the original doors. But somebody said to me at one time, these were the original doors, they're not. These are not the original doors up there. That is at the side. But not, these top ones are not. And when this floor was in with six forms, and I think one half platform, the joiner's bill was exactly the same. So ladies and one gentleman, that is how you got your hall, and that's as far as I know about it. Thank you. <coughs> Oars. Oars went in there. And the sails went in there. The sails went in the hooks in the middle. Oars. I've got some of that. Yeah. Just come up there. Some of the harvest. Oh, they went up the side there, Nana. The men were very took them to a drama festival in St. Rod. I once went to a, I was, had to step into a drama festival once in St. Rod as an understudy. And I'd heard the thing said that often, I could say that off heart anyway. And the fellow that was doing this part took the flu. And three of, the, three of these people, it was their business in Great Waters, was the name it. It was a lifeboat play. And three of the crew had to wear these Logan life boyfriends. And the adjudicator said there was one man never was in a lifeboat in his life. And that was me. And I was the only one who was in a lifeboat. <laughs> What's upstairs here now, Jimmy? Pardon, that's where you went for your pay. Oh, you got five bob on a winter lunch and uh, seven, no seven and six and a winter lunch, five bob in a summer lunch. That's what what's up there? there? Hmm? What's up there now? Trifles and tables. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is, are the cobbles still underneath the floor? Yes, so. Yeah, if you lift the floor, you can see. Uh, uh, underneath that, underneath that one there, that uh, the judge group room there at the top. There's a huge ring in cement as thick as my wrist which restrained the boat when she was coming back down there. And they had mm. things they called dead men on the wheels. <coughs> there was two brake men who walked beside the big wheels and retained them that way. But there was this huge hawser held her in that great ring and it was underneath that. There was also two huge wooden pillars in the deck of that field across the road. And that was for bringing her up onto the green before they put her back in the cottage. But the the double blocks, double blocks. I once saw a horse, uh, one of the horses break it. One of the horses broke once and stuck some hot in the ear, and it was like burning with a red hot poker. It wasn't any faster than the horses, really, are it? No. It wasn't caterpillar, really. No. But when you were out at sea, were you rowing? Aye. Hmm? Were you rowing? It was a rowing, it was a rowing boat. What? Uh, she was sailing and rowing. Uh -huh. I don't know anything in this boat. No. No, she was Liverpool self writing type, sailing and rowing. Eight, eight. Ten rows, ten foot rows. Ten. Craig uh -huh. Hutton and I had the privilege of having a centre boat which gave her an extra kill. Oh. No stability, and you push this centre board down. That was all right. If you can pull it back up, you've got about ten gallons of water, but you get soaked. <laughs> you hear that switched off right now? It's switched off. Yes, 
she was taken by the Malak Road to New England Bay. The last, the last launch was New England Bay.